As Lisa Thomas Barnett mentioned, my name is Kevin Smith. I'm a master's student at Cal State LA. And today I'm going to be presenting uh, my analysis of the hafted bifaces from the Redwood Box Cache. The Redwood Box Cache contained over 200 utilitarian and non utilitarian artifacts in superb condition, representing Nicolaino, Russian, and Aleut cultures. Among these exceptional artifacts contained within the cache were an assemblage of bifaces manufactured from European bottle glass, as well as both flaked and ground lithic bifaces in a variety of forms. Thank you. In addition to these artifacts, nine bifaces were found to still be hafted or recently detached from their associated handles. It's worth noting that this exceptional preservation is rarely found in archaeological settings and that few archaeologists will ever encounter a single hafted biface in their career, let alone nine in one assemblage. For those of you in fields other than archaeology, the term biface is used to describe tools, often stone tools, which have been worked on both faces to help thin, shape, and sharpen them. Hafting refers to setting these tools into handles, drill spindles, or spear and arrow shafts using glue, cordage, or both materials combined. Finally, the term lithic refers to tools made from stone. Therefore, hafted bifaces are tools reflecting the combination of multiple elements and could be knives, drills, scraping implements, or projectiles. This slide depicts some of these tools that have been found in the California Channel Island context before. Analysis of these items was conducted at the Archaeology Laboratory and Curation Facility on San Nicolas Island. Methods used in analyzing these artifacts were morphometric trait analysis uh, using the naked eye and 10 power hand lens. Initial questions I came up against in examining this collection pertain to function, style, material type, manufacturing sequence, and cultural affiliation. Pertaining to function, we must first determine whether we are looking at projectile points such as spear or harpoon heads, hafted to detachable four shafts, hafted drills, hafted scrapers, or perhaps a collection of knives. Redwood, though strong enough to be used as a knife handle, is a soft wood and is therefore not well suited to receive the heavy impacts so routinely required in a projectile. There is no evidence of cordage lashing behind or around the blade seat to prevent splitting of the wooden handle or shaft upon impact if it was to be used as a projectile. The wooden portion is ovate or biconvex in all specimens, unlike drill shafts which require a round cross section. Handles are purposefully short and blades purposefully blunt tipped in several specimens as well. And the blade seats often exhibit a step left between the wooden element and the stone element, which would impede the ability of a projectile in penetrating the rough hide of any animal. Based on these observations, the hafted bifaces from the redwood box appear to me to be knives. In this image, you can also see the wide array of blade shapes represented, including triangular, shouldered, diamonded, biconvex, and rectangular. It's interesting to note that the second specimen from the right appears to be broken and then retouched, but still retains that square, uh, square overall shape. Long, slender-handled knives with short, flaked stone blades were documented among the Gavrilino and Shumash tribes during the early protohistoric period. According to ethnographic accounts, these knives were routinely worn on the head, either under a headband or in the hair, much like women wear chopsticks in their hair today. It was also suggested by Dr. Volanowicz that a maritime people may have benefited from the extra buoyancy of a longer handle as the knife would float and could then be easily retrieved if lost to the water while fishing or shellfish harvesting. Though these items do appear to be somewhat standard for knives of the Southern California region, one specimen exhibiting blades hafted to both sides is the single most unique hafted biface within the assemblage. And I really can't infer as to the function of this other than it must have been somewhat of a specialized task. This slide depicts trends in overall lengths and of the hafted bifaces, lithic blades, and wooden handles represented within the assemblage. 
Uh, here, graphs represent the width and thickness of both the, the lithic bifaces and their respective wooden handles. Though variations in overall shape are present within the assemblage, the material types themselves are remarkably consistent. The blades appear to be largely manufactured from sedimentary lithic sources, as evidenced by the banding present in nearly every specimen. The glue used to half the blade to the handle appears to be primarily produced from asphaltum tar, and the handles are all carved from redwood. No trees are present on San Nicolas Island, and so the redwood required for manufacturing knife handles was likely acquired from coves where driftwood still washes ashore today, riding the California current south from California's northwest coast. Asphaltum, a naturally occurring petroleum tar, still washes up from offshore seeps in great quantities where it can be gathered in, in the high intertidal zone. Finally, the stones that predominate the biface assemblage appear, appear to be largely comprised of the Monterey geologic formation, which only occurs on the island in very rare and small conglomerate cobbles. However, th these formations are common along the Southern California coast, and a cursory survey of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, the closest mainland point to San Nicolas Island at roughly 60 miles away, contains all colors, textures, and gradients of Monterey lithic materials represented in the hafted biface assemblage. Replicative studies were performed to gain a better understanding of manufacturing processes by recreating a hafted biface with only the materials and methods that were available to the original craftspeople or craftsperson who manufactured the box cache artifacts. The redwood driftwood handle was manufactured by first splitting out a handle using a whalebone wedge and sandstone maul. The blank was roughed out with simple flake tools Sanding was accomplished using dried shark skin for sandpaper, which functions as an abrasive tool due to its prominent dermal denticles or skin teeth. And finally, the handle was burnished on a sandstone slab. Next, though it seems logical to saw a groove into the distal portion of the handle for a blade seat, close analysis of the original artifacts show that the blade seat was in fact bored out in a somewhat concave shape with a biconvex cross section matching the cross-sections and overall contracting stem shape of many of the bifaces. To accomplish this, I used a simple slender metavolcanic flake. Interestingly, this technique takes far more time invested and effort invested than simply sawing a groove in the end of the handle. However, greater structural integrity is accomplished by leaving wood in place on both sides of the blade. This added structural strength becomes very important when horizontal pressure is applied to the hafted biface, as is in the case of using the tool as a knife. Next, glue was made by transferring heated stones known as tarring pebbles to asphaltum in an abalone shell mixing dish. Asphaltum will function as a glue at this stage, but its adhesive qualities are improved by adding amalgams which work as binders. A close examination of the asphaltum present on the original artifacts indicates the use of pulverized shell as a unique additive to this glue. This shell amalgam was noted by CSULA's Jessica Colston while examining artifacts from the Channel Islands at the Smithsonian Institution under Dr. Torben Rick. Next, the most commonly occurring biface represented within the assemblage, a siliceous shale ground and flaked blade was replicated. First, by splitting along the calcareous layers with the stone, within the stone, more silica-rich layers were isolated. Residual calcareous chalky layers were then abraded away on a sandstone slab, and the isolated churdy shale layers were then pressure flaked into a refined biface. Finally, the biface was hafted and the knife complete. The overall construction time of, a half to, of this hafted biface was a little under two hours, so likely if you had a lot of experience like these people certainly did, you could have manufactured one of these in about an hour. It's interesting to note that the siliceous shale can be manufactured into a refined biface with ease using solely grinding and polishing processes. One of the most common slate biface production techniques among Aleut peoples one of the unhafted bifaces within the cache seems to exhibit this Aleut manufacturing strategy. 
However, it was produced from sandstone instead of from slate, which does not fit perfectly within Aleut lithic reduction strategies. In contrast, not a single artifact within the hafted biface assemblage reflects this Pacific Northwest Coast manufacturing technique. Instead, the hafted bifaces were produced through a grinding and flaking technique, a technique that has been previously described by Rosenthal on San Nicolas Island and has been recently uncovered in Middle Holocene deposits at CASNI 40. So the overall hafted biface assemblage reflects a unique Nicolaino manufacturing process dating back at least 4,000 years. However, in light of the ground and polished unhafted biface, as well as artifacts characteristic of the Aliu peoples, it may be inferred that the individuals or individual that compiled this cache may have represented multiple traditions or cultural affiliations. The lone woman of San Nicolas Island was no doubt in contact, perhaps, and perhaps influenced by Russian and Aleut sea mammal hunters who stayed on, this, on San Nicolas Island for a time. The original accounts of the lone woman indicate that she carried a bone knife and had a habit of caching tools and other items around the island. Though we can't say for certain at this time that the hafted bifaces or the cache itself belong to the lone woman, it is certainly a possibility. In the future, I hope to x-ray these artifacts to help determine the hafting elements and see what they look like and compare them to typologies that they may fit into. We may use Roman spectrometry or x-ray diffraction analysis to help further determine the lithic sources of these blades as well. Finally, due to the vast array of artifacts within the Redwood box cache, the representation of multiple cultures and the fantastic preservation of these artifacts, in my opinion, this cache represents one of the greatest finds on the California Channel Islands this century. I'd like to acknowledge these folks, especially the United States Navy, and I'd like to dedicate my presentation to my grandma Ethnia. <laughs>